Um, cool. Well, let's get started on the next topic. And, you know, somewhat selfishly, this is what, this is my bread and butter, right? I, I do land development um, in Arizona and Texas. And so we all understand what land is. It's, it's a pretty complex equation. And right now the market is on fire for a number of reasons. And so today um, I asked Mitch to join just, you know, again, bringing the Wall Street view of uh, what makes sense for a deal. And so we're going to dig deep on that right now. All right. Cool. Mitch, can you see it? We're good. All right. Awesome. So Red Oak, uh, this is this. I am the CEO of Red Oak. Um, and so today we'll be talking about a few things, but primarily what I really want to, you know, go over with you all is a brief bio of us, just so, just so that you know who I am um, and the team, but the market, you know, you see a lot of headlines around ex existing home sales and new starts and kind of, you know, price, your, your price appreciation. But what really matters is you know, the, the leading indicators before all of that, right? And that comes into the form of land and builders. So we'll go over at a high level what's happening with the housing demand and supply. That's always the, uh, the big question mark we see. We'll talk more specifically about land and, and what's happening with land and, um, and how the builders shift all that. And then ultimately we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk about how do you make money in this business, right? So with that said, so real quick, I'm going to give you two minutes as to who I am, who the team is, and we'll go from there. So my company is Red Oak. We, we buy property in Texas. We buy property in Arizona. Um, and we either do what is called horizontal, which means we buy the land, do all the utilities, and then sell it to builders like DR Horton or KB Homes. Or uh, more, more recently, we're, we're doing what is called vertical as well. So horizontal is phase one. Phase two is vertical, where you go in and build a building or you build single family homes, what have you. And I would lie to you all if, if I said it was all me that does all this. My team is growing rapidly. Um, you know, we're just one of the more hires is Dan Ross here, who is a legend from Exxon Mobil. He is a landman or was a landman at Exxon Mobil and is now my main guy on the ground doing everything from surveys and permits and working with all the engineers to make things happen, right? So uh, it takes a, it really does take a village to make all this, all this happen. Um, and again, Brandon Hall is on the team for tax advisory. Dan Castro is a legend in real estate from the legal side. Uh, Rich Neagle is an award-winning builder. And, you know, Brian Kelly is a, is a hungry di digital marketer. That's uh, this whole event he put on. So hats off to him. So it, again, it takes a whole village to make this happen, not just me, right? And then I think what I, it's really important to um, go over this. This guy is my, my personal mentor. And um, if you look at his resume here, I think you'll probably see why. So he is the biggest developer in, in Hawaii. Um, and just a story, I, I, I was with him recently for dinner and, uh, there's a part of, of Kona Island called Waikola. And, uh, if you've ever been there, it's this resort with pools and all this kind of, you know, gondolas and all that. And the, the big designer there, and you might know the name is Steve Wynn. So Steve Wynn is the guy in Vegas who has built all of the casinos and that the whole idea of themed, um, themed casinos. Well, Steve Wynn got the idea by himself, but the builder of that area was this guy right here, right? So this guy just got done with two casinos in Eastern Europe. He's done 6,000 multifamily units, uh, 10 multiplex theaters, 12 hotels, uh, three master plan communities. And um, when, when I was with him this, this past week, he, uh, he was telling me, he's like, you know, Tom, I, I actually forget. Um, I'll drive by a project and, and his daughter will say, dad, you built that. He's like, oh yeah, I did build that. He's, I mean, he's built a lot of stuff, right? So Long story short, he's he's the guy on on our team that really keeps me honest, makes sure that I'm not making mistakes in my performers or what have you. So, um, hats off to him for being a um, just a, a good support system. So, real quick, um, we have five projects in action this uh, as of this year, and we're looking to pick up six, seven more next year. But, you know, if you look at Austin and and Kerry Heiner is going to go into more detail later about what's happening in Austin, but there's a lot of growth and we all know the Oracle thing, the Tesla thing, the new Google office downtown, uh, Facebook, um, Apple, AMD is doubling down. Just last two weeks ago, Samsung announced a $17 billion plant out in Taylor. There's just a lot of movement, right? Um, and so we're focused mostly in the South corridor right now, Southeast, about 20 to 30 minutes from Austin. We think that's gonna be the next big spot to blow up. Um, and then long-term, we, we also believe that the San Antonio and Austin MSA will essentially combine in the next 10 to 15 years. So, and then we got, um, we got a student housing project up north near Fort Hood. That's a 150 unit, uh, four story building. I'll be meeting with the president of the college uh, next week. And then we're building a, 
basically like an investor model here, 120 triplexes up north near Fort Hood to give housing to the, all the soldiers. Kind of a sad story, but the soldiers, well, like they get a stipend for their rents. They're living in motels and hotels because there's just no housing for rent. So it's just a, it's a massive need right now in that area. Um, and then we're closing out our project in Arizona. That was our, our first one that we did and um, we're exiting in the next three to six months. So all good stuff ahead. Tom, let me ask you this. One of the things that continue to impress, uh, one of the things that you do so well is just finding opportunities. How are you finding these opportunities or, or, you know, what does your network look like? You know, just give us a few nuggets on how potential investors who perhaps want to try to do this themselves. uh, There's always an opportunity to get access to these deals from a passive perspective and in a limited partner format. But you know, if we want to go and execute, you know, give us a few of those secrets on on how you're able to go out and and uh, see these opportunities. Sure. So I'll give you two secrets. Um, the first one is if the the deal is public and it's on market, it's probably not not a great deal. Um, any great deal is going to be off market. You know, talking to some 89 year old grandma who just wants to get rid of her land for her family, right? Um, so you really got to be networked very tightly to the locals. Um, and understanding where all the deals are. So one, focus on off-market deals. Um, and then two, you know, I think a lot of land developers, they get a piece of land on their desk and they say, oh, great, how can I make use of this land to maximize my profits? Well, I do it the other way around. I say, great, I want to build student housing. Where, where do I want to b- build it? And what should I build it on, right? Or I want to build a, you know, a, a community for the soldiers. Great, where should I build it? And then I go find the land to make it happen. Right. That makes it a lot easier than having this ambiguous, oh, awesome. I have, you know, I have 40 acres here with sewer. How do I, you know, do I build commercial? Do I build retail? Um, so I do it the other way around versus other, you know, most other developers. Yeah. Taking a top down approach. 100%. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then right now, our valuation of projects is $150 million over five projects. Um, I would love to scale up very quickly. But again, I've seen a lot of guys in this business. I just heard last night I talked to my builder. Um, a big guy in Arkansas just went bankrupt uh, because he took on too much uh, projects. And if you look at China, you know, the, I, I know exactly why, what happened there. And effectively, they had too many projects, too much leverage. And it's, this is a cash flow game, 100%. You need to have operators that know month to month the, the fine-tuned details of cash flow. And that's exactly what happened in China with the Evergrande deal. Um, poor cash flow management. Great operator. They could execute, but just too, mon- too many deals poor cash flow management, and they'll, get, they'll get you in trouble. So I say that because we could triple the projects um, going in the next year, but we're being very diligent as to picking just the best home run deals that we can find. So, okay. And then I'm going to get into the details now from a builder sentiment. And um, actually, let me get some people in the room here. There's some, okay, cool. So I think when you think about land and when you think about real estate market in general, it's, again, it's not as simple as just looking at the price Schiller index. Um, or just the year-over-year prices or whatever it is, right? Or price appreciation. What it, it comes down again to what the, what the builders are doing and what the supply and demand curve looks like. So if you look at this chart here, um, you know, despite what you hear on, this, on, on all the YouTube gurus, uh, if you talk to any developer, they will tell you that right now, this is the best time in their entire history of doing this business, right? Um, and builders would say roughly the same with a few constraints, that being labor shortages and supply shortages, which we know. But sentiment's still strong. I mean, uh, again, this, this chart's pretty simple. If it's over 50, it's a positive. If it's over 70, it's, you know, it's essentially, uh, it's a very rare and very bullish sign. Today, we're at 76, right? It's, it's coming down mainly because of the supply constraints that we're seeing uh, in the market. But in general, they're very bullish in the next 24 months um, as to what's to come, okay? Now, part of the reason, if you hear any earnings calls from Toll Brothers or D.R. Horton, Margins are consistently above 25% um, and, and they're going upwards. So they're figuring out ways to make more money in tough times with supply uh, constraints. Um, so there's that. How they're doing that? Well, they're building higher density. And what does this mean? So if you go out to your yard, if you own a yard and you measure your, your lot size, um, my guess is it's probably between 6,000 square feet and 10,000 square feet for most of you. Well, over time, that has come down right? Uh, the average lot size today is around 8,000 square feet, which is about 0.2 acres. So builders are now building homes on 6,000 square foot lots, 5,000 square foot lots. They're buying smaller lots. 
they're building homes, um, you know, just, just more cheaply, right? So for example, a good quality home might have a two by six every 18 inches in the wall. Well, they're now building uh, the two by fours every 24 inches in walls, right? They're not having pitch ceilings, they're doing flat ceilings. The windows are more standard sizes. Um, they're not doing things that essentially add customization. They're, they're more or less having, you know, stamp and repeat sort of processes, right? Um, so that's, that's what I want to let you know is that while there's some tightening on, uh, on the supply chain, these builders are savvy and they have teams out there that are figuring out ways to still uh, grow these margins. Tom, let me ask you a question. You know, one of the things that uh, I always uh, believed in in the investment world is uh, a couple of things. Well, one is don't fight the Fed and the trend is your friend. Uh, in this scenario here with this chart and sentiments being at an all-time high, uh, is the trend your friend? Do you believe that, you know, the sentiment is going to continue? Um, yeah, generally, yes. I, there's a lot of factors that go into this, right? But I think one of the most important factors we all need to be looking at just generally is the 10 year note. Okay. And I say that because uh, when you think about banks, you think about mortgage rates, typically the, a, a 30 year fixed mortgage rate will, will trend about 200 basis points above the 10 year. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. Well, if the 10 years at one and a half percent, your mortgage rates are probably three and a half percent. All right. Which is roughly where, where we all are to, uh, today. And as an investor, you can tack on another quarter to half point on top of that. Right. So I, I think we're, we'll have real risk if the 10 year gets to three, three and a half percent. Right. So that's, that's when inflation is going to really kick in. Yeah. Now there's a lot of debate around transitory inflation. Um, I mean, if you look at Kathy Woods, she's talking about deflation concerns around innovation and whatnot. So there's a lot of economists battling this out. Um, but right now we know that the Fed has no intention of taking the 10 year to 3% for, you know, three, four years out. Right. So uh, builders are definitely looking at that. That's, you know, that affects cost of capital and cost of borrow. So the 10 year note might be one of the most important elements to be monitoring as an investor, if you're in real estate, for sure. Good point. Okay. Um, this is, this might be the most important slide in this presentation. And what this is, is a index by a company called Zonda. Zonda is a platform. It's about $2,000 a month. Builders rely on this very heavily. Right. And um, what this index is, is basically saying, okay, well, essentially it's, it's the demand divided by the supply. Okay. How, how much demand is there for build ready lots versus supply? Now I just did a white paper uh, about three months ago uh, when it was around 1.8 times supply. It's now at 2.3 times supply. So there is a, there's a massive frenzy out there uh, for lots by builders. And on the next slide, I'll, um, I'll show you some things here about that, but uh, it's, it's, it's concerning. They, they can't find enough lots to, to build the homes to meet the massive demand on housing, right? So, so I've got a question for you, Tom. You know, it, with real estate being extremely inelastic, and, and for those of you that don't know what that means, it's the ability for uh, demand and supply to essentially catch up. Uh, and it just takes a lot longer for, for that to happen in real estate, right? And so with all of that this information here and the amount of, of building that's going on, do you think that the supply can actually creep up and, and meet the demand? And, and what, what, just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I'll, I'll hit it on two points. One I'll show you later in, the, in this deck here, but one Marco might talk about. And, um, you know, a lot of people talk about this foreclosure fear, right? There's, you know, this is wave of foreclosures. And I think it's come down now to a risk of 1.5 million uh, units. Today, there's a 3.8 million unit shortage of housing to meet a balanced market. Balanced market meaning a six month supply. Okay. Um, and believe me, agents would love to have that supply hit the market. You know, there's just, there's not a lot of supply out there. Um, if you really dig deep though, you'll find that of the, the, the scare of 1. whatever 5 million foreclosures, um, many real estate economists only believe about 100,000 when it would hit the market. And that's twofold. One is because the representation of the foreclosures are just, they're, they're just not accurate for a number of reasons. Uh, but two, you got to realize too, Wall Street in the last six months to 12 months now looks at real estate as an asset class. 
And if you're out there in the market trying to do 1031 exchanges or trying to buy a house and you're like, who the hell is buying these homes with cash? Well, look, no, look at Wall Street. They have you know, billions of dollars now to deploy. They're not gonna go through loans. That's not how it works. They're gonna come to the market with cash and they need to deploy this capital. So if you had a million and a half units come to market for foreclosures, they would be chopping out the bits to get those, those units. So I think we, we have to understand too that Wall Street is now playing in this, in this market, which is why the Biden administration is figuring out how to get them back out. Um, I don't know how they're gonna do it. I, it's gonna be tricky, but um, I, I don't think supply will rebound nearly as fast as we would, would want it to. So, um, but back to the kind of, kind of the point here, let me let some people in here. But this, this chart here, and again, this, this is essentially a presentation of charts, but um, this is what builders have been buying in terms of lots and land over the last uh, you know, three, four years. And part of the reason that we're, we're now in such a frenzy is they've only been buying uh, lots and growth of lots you know, at a four to 6% clip versus the previous year. So now they realize, wow, that there's a massive shortage that we just were trying to hedge. And um, you can see the charts here, they're, they're beginning to buy at much faster rates, right? Uh, and by the way, this is expected to go through 2024, 25, so. So, but Mitch, to your question, I, it's interesting. I, I, I'm gonna break it down right here as to how you think about supply and demand, okay? So this is a, um, I don't know there's a yellow one. Okay, anyways, um, this is a chart that shows what we think will be total home sales through 2022, okay? 6.7 million units, okay? Are you following? Am I frozen? You're not. Okay, cool, okay. So yeah, so there's uh, 6.7 6 million units is what we forecast through next year, okay? So this is, what you see as new construction homes in the pipeline. Okay, now this, this is a, a, a aggressive number because you're assuming that builders won't just keep some of these in backlog. And today builders keep about 40% of their pipeline in backlog, the hedge risk. But let's just say that they, they come to fruition, they build all these units. Well, including condos and apartments and everything else, there's 1.6 million units in the pipeline uh, that will probably be built in 2022, 23, okay? And, and then just above a million for single family homes. Okay, so we have 6.7 total need, right? We have 1.6 million here, okay? Now, if you look at the, the run rates as to what we're selling in existing homes, right? So homes that are already on the market or that could go on the market, you can see that that's coming down substantially because people are not leaving their homes. Uh, they sell their home in Austin, great. Where else do I go buy, right? It, it's the same price. So you're seeing this, this run rate come down pretty substantially. Uh, now the forecast next year is that around 6 million plus units of existing homes will be will hit the market, but we haven't seen that since October of 2020. So again, um, interesting. Uh, again, if we look at the, what we think will be the actual number of new builds going into 22, we're looking at about 1.3 million. Okay. So it is, it is going up, which is helping the supply curve, but not fast enough. And let's break down the actual math. Okay. So Again, 3.8 million home shortage today. We see that we expect 6.7 million homes um, to be needed for 2022, okay? That's 11.5 million homes needed next year, okay? So if we assume that somehow the existing homes go up from 5.2, the annual rate to 6.4, which would be amazing. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, we then have a gap to meet the supply or the demand of 4.1 million homes, okay? And then if we add back in, okay, great. People like me are building homes too. So there's 1.3 million of those. We still have a 2.8 million home gap from today's number, right? So that's only gonna shrink the, the, the supply uh, to demand curve by one third. So even at that run rate, we're still three to four years out from a balanced market, okay? Now what that means, okay, well, well if you hear people talking about housing crashes, and all that. This is why a lot of us who are actually in the industry are confused. Like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Um, supply is not going to be balanced until at least three, or four years out. So that doesn't mean that homes will appreciate at twenty percent plus, like we've seen in the last 12, 18 months. But we do think it will normalize back to the three to five percent year over year um, until the supply and demand curve is back to e e uh, equilibrium. 
Yeah, if I could just interject, uh, I recently heard the CEO of Toll Brothers uh, on CNBC. And uh, one of the most interesting things, you know, about understanding what the future might hold for the housing market, just look at stock prices. Stock prices are a future indicator of potential earnings. And look at ticker symbol TOL, that's Toll Brothers. Uh, They're up over 35% if not 40% year to date. So I think that's a great indicator. Uh, if you've got questions about what does this market look like, take a look at those uh, companies like those big home builders like the Toll Brothers, and, and that'll certainly uh, add some investor confidence in this space. Yeah, and let's not, you know, let's, let's not be, be naive, right? These, these guys got, got damaged really bad in 08, right? Um, that, was, that was a big hit. They're not gonna do the same mistake again. They will control the the risk a lot more than they were back in 08 so yeah and that was more of a credit issue yeah, where was, you know the yeah. money locked up and now money is free flowing so 100 percent right um and this is this is a really important graph too and I'm, i think most of you probably understand the concept here but where is affordability on the map right and if you look across where we were in other times um you'll see that when it drops below 100 um it's it's not a good market it's pretty unaffordable well it's we're getting there but we're still, it's very affordable relative to, the, to history. Um, and that's due to the low borrowing costs of homes. You know, um, and Zuber has a great video on this where wage inflation is actually a really good indicator as to where we think prices may go with homes. And you know, if you're a, 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 someone in tech or if you're in a more white collar job, if you wanna call it that, you're seeing wage increases for sure, right? Um, we do know that in services and industries like that, wages have been rather stagnant, but those tend to be renters not by home buyers. And so um, until this comes down to around 100 or so, until we see the 10 year go to a three, 4% clip, um, we're, we're still very bullish on the housing market. And um, Carrie Heiner is gonna go into more of these details about Austin a little bit later. So, cool. So the last thing I'll say, you know, again, I, um, I'll be somewhat transparent with you all. We, we obviously are scaling up our company very fast. So I, I was in uh, Laguna Beach the last few days talking to some big institutions for our capital. And um, I, I've always been a fan of helping out the, what is called the retail investor, right? And for, for those of, that, of you that invest with me, there's 45 to 100 of you, give or take, uh, depends on the project. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of documentation, coordination and all that. And so after 2022, we'll be only working with inst- institutional money. But until then, for the guys or gals that wanna get involved in these deals, the question is, well, how would I want to get, or how would I get involved in land deals if I didn't want to take on the work myself? And that's why I brought Mitchell on to kind of give me, give you all that Wall Street viewpoint as well as us break it down for you all. So, if there's this white, there's a line right here. I don't know what this is, but um, long story short, you know, I have uh, these projects all have some uh, friends of mine and investors that I've worked with for many years. Uh, these deals are two to three year deals. If you wanted to invest in these deals, you would have to write a check size of uh, $50,000 or bigger. And then a few other items here. Um, the preferred return is between 20 to 27% annually. And again, that's, that's preferred, right? So you're, you're first in line to get profits before anyone on my team. Um, one trick that we often see investors do, given the just really competitive real estate market is uh, and stock market that is obviously kind of frothy right now is um, we see investors recently looking at their self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks and even deferred sales trusts to invest in land deals um, as a way to diversify their portfolio. Yeah, and if I could just interject here, because sure. you know certainly an option and you've got the capital if folks have done a good job in, in saving. Um, just one thing to consider when you invest in real estate and in some of those qualified accounts, you do lose the tax benefit uh, that real estate does offer. You know, right. one of the next bullet points you're talking about K ones, um, but really that preferred return is is return of capital. So it's it's yeah. you know it's not taxed. Um, obviously, consult a professional. Uh, you know, uh, tax uh, professional, but you, you you definitely you're going to lose some of that um, tax efficiency going that route. Just uh, I always want to mention that. Yeah, and that's that, that's one of the things about owning a natural property is you know there's a there's a massive, um, you know, tax advantage in doing so. So it's, it's, it's often misconstrued that the idea of buying properties through your IRAs and everything, that's, that's actually not the best way to, to, to do it. Um, things like private lending and lending on deals, that's a really great instrument for a self-directed IRA because to your point, Mitch, it's, it's tax, you know, sheltered, right? So. 
Cool. So that's that's what I have for you all. I I think it's really important though, and this this is just one slide, but I want to um again what we wanted to talk about mainly is kind of the the condition of the housing market at a macro level and to help you all understand that you know there's a lot of noise out there on youtube and these people who don't know about how they're talking about to be honest and uh the data is pretty clear when you dig dig deep and so that was real, kind of the intent of this presentation is to hope for to, to, to give you all clarity as to where the market is from a builder developer standpoint and that's a leading indicator to where you'll see prices in the future so Tom, let me go back to one of the things you talked about, which was the investor return and what that dividend looked like or in the terms of a preferred rate of return, which uh, was you know 20 to 27%, just depending on the deal. Um, I absolutely love those deal economics as somebody who curates private uh, real estate deals and match uh, operators like yourself with uh, investors, whether they be uh, the family office or they be the RIA advisors or accredited investors. Um, one of the things that I, you know, what we try and do on Deal Hunter is educate people on how to actually understand these deals. And, you know, obviously you're going to look at the pro forma, but to the layman, you know, how does one actually go about, you know, looking at some of these deals? What are some tips that you'd recommend to, you know, the accredited investor, perhaps somebody that hasn't done any of these real estate deals? What do you, what are some things that, you know, that I should be asking? Yeah. I'll give you three pieces of advice, and um, and I and I see it all too often, right? And, and a lot of investors that do invest in deals that get burned, they subconsciously invest in the person, right? The selling motion that they're being sold, um, and not necessarily the things that might matter. And if if it were me as an investor, I'd I'd want to look at a few things. One, what is the operator's experience, right? Um, how are they organized in their company? Just you know, more or less, how are they doing their operations? Okay. Is it just them or do they have a scalable team that has systems in place and you know methods to keep things aligned? Two, I would be asking for a month to month breakdown of cash flow. And th th this includes multifamily syndications. You know, you often see Grant Cardone out there pitching, but I bet if you ask them for a breakdown of their cash flow on that project, they wouldn't give it to you because there's probably some risk uh, in that in that motion. So cash flow, this is a cash flow management business, 100 percent cash burn. Um, understanding how to hedge the risk in the cash burn, um, understanding how to hedge the risk exposure in certain hurdles that you might come across. That might be the most important thing after operator. And then three, um, you know, I had the idea several years ago, but your, your guy, Siraj, when we had that conversation, we, he asked a great question. He was like, what, what, where's your break even, right? You know, in the worst case, on the downside, what, what, where's this break even? And I think to understand that on every project itself, kind of that stress test is really important as well, right? So if you have a 10% downside to break even, that's tight, right? You should only be investing in deals that have a, a big amount of margin so that if you do hit a hurdle, you have that flexibility to be nimble and still execute with a profit. I think that's great advice and ultimately at least be able to get my money back. Right. And, right. you know, yeah. I think, you know, just to kind of add a little bit more to, to that, um, when you're dealing with, you know, sophisticated investors, they certainly ask uh, great questions uh, in terms of uh, that specific deal. They ask about capital stack and where you fall in line mm -hmm. uh, if, if things don't go right. Um, so I think being really thoughtful, you know, the, the qualitative side um, is often um, really engaged through understanding the quantitative behind that. So understanding the numbers helps you as an investor ask better questions. And so I think use the numbers to really ask questions right. and really understand the deal. And, you know, I, if anybody out there also has any suggestions, uh, we'd love for this to be a little interactive uh, for those, you know, professional real estate investors or any of the uh, uh, other folks who are presenting today. If you've got any suggestions, please, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to uh, learn a little bit and perhaps uh, educate everybody else on, on the call. That's right. Um, yeah, we're, we're always open to learn how others look at deals too. So 